Praise the Lord, Morning Star. Why don't we just give him one praise offering, clap offering, thanking him for his goodness. So thankful for what I feel in this house. God has been so good to us, and I'll have to say I'm thankful for God giving me 50 years on this earth. Why don't we say thank you, Jesus, for his blessing and his prosperity. I'm going to ask that you would open in your Bibles to Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Such a blessing always to just be a part of praise and worship here from the top on down. It's a blessing or as you give yourself to praise and worshiping our God and the singers and musicians all in harmony. It's such a blessing to come into this place and just exalt the name above every name. Amen. Amen, amen. And again, we're so thankful for all of our visiting friends, the saints of God, all who are watching online. We thank God that he has blessed you and put you in a position to receive from the word of God this afternoon. The scripture reads in Hebrews 13 and 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content. Everybody say content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So to be content with such things as you have. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for another wonderful day to praise you, to worship in your presence, and to receive and release the rhema word from on high. Still any storm in me that may hinder your peace and your voice also empower me through the Holy Ghost to convey with clarity your will today heal all who are sick in body especially our dear brother Frank who's in the hospital and also all those who are weak in spirit help them right now we magnify you we thank you in advance in the precious and the holy name of Jesus everybody say amen and you may be seated When it is common to you, it confuses the enemy. When it is common to you, it will confuse the enemy. I want you to focus on this phrase, as I believe it's going to set the tone for this message. When you're in the fight of your life, it's not a time to try out a new weapon. I'm going to say that again. When you're in the fight of your life, that is not the time to try out a new weapon. Let me see if this will work, says nobody whose life is on the line. I remember I went hunting for whitetail deer out of the country, never hunted like that before. It was a bow hunt. It was not my bow. It was not my state. It was not my tree stand. But yet there I was in the freezing cold and the darkness up in a tree stand with a, a, a bow and arrow or compound bow that was not mine. And I, I was all for, you know, trying it out. But here comes this beautiful white buck that caused my heart to pop out of my chest. And I got excited. But, you know, the thing is I didn't even know how to shoot that bow. I've maybe shot it once or twice prior. And I can tell you that that wasn't the time to try to practice or to work on, on your, your, you know, working on target practice. It would have been much better had I spent time and had I, you know, uh, understood and took measurements and made sure that my uh, measurements matched up with the bow. But such is life many times that when you are in a heated situation, when you really are fighting for 
uh, survival or when you're fighting for your family, it's not the time to try out some new way of doing things, but there's something tried and true that we must trust in. That's why it's so wonderful to come to the house of God and lift him up because this is what we have been doing for a little while. Even through tough times, we come and lift him up. We magnify the name above every name. And as we do so, we know that as the praises go up, the blessings come down. You may walk in with a rough attitude, but as you praise him and as you exalt him year after year, you know every encounter changes your countenance so that you leave this place. You can't leave the same way that you walked in. Why? Because there's something to praise. There's something to worship. It's been tried and tested and we know that it is his will. It is what summons and opens the door to his presence. So we exalt him and we magnify him. This is something that we've done, been doing for a long time and we're going to continue to do it into eternity. That's why right now you can't stop giving him praise but continue to lift up your voice and say thank Thank you, Jesus. I'm ex exalting your name because you are so good. This is what I do. This is who I am. I'm a praiser. I'm a worshiper. Through thick and thin, I'm going to magnify you. Not the time to try out some new theory. Not the time to be in a place where you're trying new theological uh, 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 teachings that don't coincide with the word of God. Can somebody say amen? amen? As we talk about this being comfortable with your weapon, this strategy was something that David practiced even from the very beginning of his military endeavors. He had been successful against the lion. Can somebody say amen? A bear, a giant. He'd been successful against a jealous king. And any enemy force that would take a stand against his God or anybody that would get in the way of him executing any proper expectation from the Lord. Here is the key. The key was it was the right God and it was the right weapon. The right God. And it was the right weapon. You see, his first major public success was against a mammoth of a man. A champion of champions. A, a warrior from his youth. Goliath was his name. Philistine was his country. The battlefield was set. Both camps were present. This was do or die. Put up or shut up time. David, out of all of the rest would be the one who would be courageous in the Lord and also consistent, consistent in his weapon of choice. Right before David confidently advances towards the challenger, he makes a critical choice. King Saul offers him his very own sword, his breastplate, his, his helmet. But David responds in a unique manner. Verse 1 Samuel 17 and 39 tells us, And David girded his sword, the king's, upon his armor, and he assayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand, and he chose them five smooth stones out of the brook. And put them in a shepherd's bag, which he had. Everybody say, which he had. Even in a script. And his sling was in his hand. And he drew near to the Philistine. Even though this was a new position or place that David found himself in, the weapon still had previously been proven. New place, new territory, new battle. But he was using weaponry that he owned, that he was comfortable with, that he was strong in. 
And from here we can draw our first lesson from this uh, uh, account that you may find yourself in a new battle and can be facing a mountain of a problem. It may be threatening your peace, but you're going to have to find that the thing that has been proven in the Lord, it will be common to you, but it will confuse the enemy. It'll be common to you, but it's going to be that which will confuse the enemy. There's some old songs that we sing. I remember mom teaching us learning to lean on Jesus. And there's songs that will pop up in my spirit when I'm troubled in my mind. That as I go back to those old proven songs, it begins to change my attitude. It begins to take me out of a, 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 a place that, that may cause me to be a little discouraged. I'm here to tell you that there are some weapons that have been given to us uh, that have been proven time and time again uh, when you hear bad news you hit the altar you you let your knees to go down because you know there's something to prayer you can worry about it uh, but you know the weapon of prayer is so powerful when you're struggling in your family situations there's something about prayer that we go to God and it's proven that as we pray he begins to move as we pray he hears us as we pray something happens in the spirit and I'm so thankful that we can go to praise we can go to worship we can go to prayer we can go to the word of God we've got all the tools we've got all the weapons that have been proven we fought against lions giants and bears we fought against demons and devils we fought against darkness and wickedness how through the word of God through the Holy Ghost because of the blood why because it's proven if you have a need today I feel the Holy Ghost if you have a need today if you have a need just trust in that which has been victorious in the past because it's proven you know how to pray for your wayward son, your wayward daughter. You know how to pray for your finances. You know how to pray for your health condition. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to boldly attack the throne of grace. He has made you worthy through the blood of the Lamb. He has given you a name, my God. You've been baptized into a name that is greater than any other name. That name is Jesus. He has given you the authority through the Holy Ghost. I said he's given you authority to put thousands to fight through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's already been proven. You've already tried it. You've already been successful. So be encouraged today in the Lord that that which is common to you, it will confuse the enemy. You want to know why? Because the enemy, when he applies a little pressure and heat, he thinks you're going to fall apart. He thinks you're going to start complaining and murmuring and worrying and being full of anxiety. But that's when you enter into the spirit. That's when you pray and say, God, I'm not going to be concerned about it. And it begins to confuse the enemy. Because you're comfortable in prayer. Because you're, you, you feel something special in praise and worship. I could hear David telling the king this. That sword is no good to me, king. Mostly because it's not mine. I have improved it. It's not mine. The Lord wants to speak to us this afternoon. The seed thought for this message, it began in this place. And I'm going to share this with you. The Lord breathed this into my spirit. He said, be careful not to sabotage your blessings. Be careful not to sabotage your salvation. Be careful not to sabotage your mercy and the grace that has been extended to you. Be careful that you don't sabotage it, that you don't spoil it. Let, let me unpack that a little bit. Now, King David is, is at his most blessed and successful state. The kingdom is consolidated. Judah and Israel are united. 
He's walking in his third anointing, not just in key, as king and prophet, but also as priest. His family is growing as much as Israel's success. He's written psalms, poems, and songs about the Lord. I'm sure now he's an accomplished musician. And I believe at this point he's a prolific songwriter. He praises and he also walks in the prophetic. He's a dancer, yet he is a destroyer of those who challenge and defy God Almighty. His household is established. His lineage is growing deep, massive roots. But in the midst of this all, he begins to sabotage the blessings and favor that flow from Jehovah. The prophet Nathan shows up with a direct word for David. And it begins with a civic situation that David assumes that he would handle legally and address it in a, a, a judgmental place. And the story or the parable that Nathan gives David was, he speaks of a man that had a singular lamb. One that he loved so much and it basically became his pet. Almost as one of his daughters. A neighboring rich man had a huge herd of sheep. And he had a guest show up and a meal was planned for this particular guest. And instead of taking from his own great flock that he currently possessed, he took the poor man's little precious, lonely, affectionate, and endearing lamb. Probably slaughtering it right next to all of the other sheep that he owned. He prepared it for his guest and gave it at his own dinner table. David, King David, judged this case immediately. He deemed the rich man worthy of death. And also that he would pay back the price of the lamb four times over for his insolence and lack of pity. But the prophet Nathan's response was this. Remember, David was sabotaging the blessing. He was anointed. He was a warrior. Warrior. He was a praiser. He, 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 he would entertain the presence of God. Wonderful, powerful king. Yet, Nathan at this stage of his life tells him, David, you are that man. You are that rich man. And out of all that you have been blessed with, you chose to take a woman to your chambers that was not your own. And then tried to cover it up through the confusion of war. But the Lord saw it all and he knows exactly what you've done, David. The child that recently conceived will die. And the peace that was in your house will no longer be as it currently is. How sad. David spoiled much of the blessings in his life. He sabotaged a good portion of the serenity that would be in his future. The question may be why? What would cause a man of such stature and such spirit to succumb to such a lowly and selfish state. The answer is connected with the first lesson that I mentioned earlier. Let me remind you of it. David was successful. David was successful when he worked or he went to war with what was his. With what was his. This is where David found success against all odds. His sling was better than the king's sword, mostly because it was his. I believe the Lord wants to drive a point home today. Because it was his. And it was proven, it was tested, and tried. 
Psalms 34 and 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I'm here to tell you that I've tried him. I've trusted in him. And because he's my God, I've walked in his goodness. I've walked in his favor. I've been in the valley of the shadow of death. But my cup has overflown. The windows have opened, have poured out blessings that I should not contain. But it's because he has been my God. I declared him glory. Lord and Savior. I declare him God over every part of my life. I wake up in the morning and I say, God, I give you complete lordship over me, over my day, over my life, over every part of who I am. And because I've tasted and seen that he's good, my God has proven himself that he'll show up in the midnight hour. He'll show up in a prison-like experience. He'll show up when you're sick. He'll show up in discouragement or depression and tries to get the best of you. Why? Because we've tasted and seen that he is good. I'm here to declare that my God is wonderful. My God is awesome. He'll do what he needs to you do on your behalf for your salvation and for your strength if you just trust in the fact that he is your God. God used Moses' personal staff, his own staff, to become a serpent and back into a rod. It was something he already possessed. Can I tell you all that God wants to use what you already have in your hands? What's common to you? Something that you've carried around for a while. Something that, but, but the whole key is you have to understand that it has to be that which is yours. I can't preach to you from my dad's uh, uh, readings in the scriptures, but I've got to read the Bible for my own self. I can't praise him completely for what he's done on your behalf because I have to be thankful for the fact that he saved me out of my situations. He saved me out of my mess. And from that place I say, Lord, I'm thankful for what you've done for me. I'm thankful for what you've done for them. But God, there's a personal testimony. There's a personal declaration that is down deep on my in my heart uh, that started a long time ago that it doesn't take me long to be thankful for what God has done. As I I look back over these 50 years I can tell you that God is good and his mercies endure forever <laughs> Moses's staff was already in his hand something that he owned something familiar God used for the miraculous you already have it you just have to really take ownership of it and fi find the will of God. It's already in your mouth. That word is near thee. It's in your mouth. It's you already have the Holy Ghost. You've already been baptized in Jesus' name. You've, you've already been washed of your sins. You, you already have been commissioned to do what you've got to do. God will use that once you understand his plan let me give you the application here. When it's yours, when it is yours, it is either handed down, it's either inherited or gifted to you when it's yours. Or the other way of getting something is it's worked for, it's sought out, it's earned, and it's rewarded. These are the ways in which you assume ownership of something. Sometimes you're going to work for it. You're going to seek it out. And sometimes it's just going to be given to you. But in both cases, in both cases, they require good stewardship to maintain. When you got the Holy Ghost, you know that God put gifts in you? He gave you gifts. But it's up to you to keep connected with God to maintain a walk with God enough so that you can recognize in this situation, in this territory, this gift is available and this gift is present. But you have to be walking with God. You have to maintain that walk, that sensitivity to God, because he already gave it to you. 
Sometimes we're waiting for so much more when God said, listen, it's already in your hand. The giant's before you, and, and, and David was smart enough to realize, you know what, it's not going to work if I take this sword that's not mine, but I know how to use this, this sling. I understand how to grab these stones from the brook. I understand how to twirl this thing around, and, 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 I, and in doing so, that's where David found his success. It's where he found it. Both ways require good stewardship to maintain. The reason that Anna is my wife is because, my wife, from my perspective, I sought her out, made a covenant before God and witnesses, and have desired to fulfill my marital and biblical expectations to this day. An agreement was made between both parties. Thank you, Jesus. I am hers and she is mine. Amen. She's my wife. I'm her husband. And I can tell you this, that you are more effective when you work with what is yours. <laughs> That's preaching all on its own. When it's yours, you're going to be more effective. That's why we've got to fight against the covetous spirit that is coming against our marriages, that, that is coming against our homes, that, that you can look at somebody else's life and for whatever reason you feel, man, I wish I had what he had or I wish I had what she had. But it's time for us to realize, no, what has God given me? What covenants am I into? What is my family? Who's my mom? Who's my dad? Who's my baby? Who are my children? Because if they're mine, then there's something about it that I'm going to be most effective as I train them up in the fear and in the admonition of the Lord. If it's your husband, love on him. If it's your wife, give her your best. Why? Because she's yours. He's yours. God will do the most with your relationship, with the blessings and the gifts that he has given you. That which you have worked for, God is going to bless you most in that place. It must be God-given, God-approved. I don't know if you've ever been in this place in your life where this thought has come to your mind or it's even been uttered by your mouth. I'm just not happy where I am. It's a dangerous thing to say. It's a dangerous thing to think that I'm not happy with where I am, with who I am, with what I have. But there's a scripture that speaks against that. It's Philippians 4 and 11. It says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am. Wherever I find myself, I am therewith to be content. Here is the key to you fighting against the enemy of your soul is regardless of how you may feel about what you have or, or who you are, you've got to get to the place where, Lord, I'm thankful. I must have had, I maybe I had a messed up upbringing, but I'm thankful, Lord, that you at least pulled me out. And today I'm not where I used to be. That's why we praise him the way we do. That's why we get so excited because some of us remember where God brought us from. Addiction was all around us. A, a promiscuity was there. All kinds of problems, but yet God pulled us out. And whatever state that we have found ourselves in, every season, every place, we've come to the house of God and said, Lord, I'm thankful for what you've given me. I, maybe I'm not exactly where I should be, but I'm not where I used to be. Lord, I'm thankful that I'm not addicted. I'm thankful that I'm not bound. I'm thankful I'm not in prison. I'm thankful that I'm not six feet under. But today I have an opportunity to praise you, to magnify you. Jesus, I'm more content than I am sad about what you've given me, what you've allowed me to become. Whatever state I find myself, young people, wait on God. Married people, wait on God. Elders, wait on God. New converts, wait on God. And in every state, I'm encouraging you to find that place of contentment. Man, it was about probably two weeks ago that 
I had a youth service coming up. I had a party I was last minute trying to throw. Had all kinds of things lined up and there was a lot going on. And I bent over in my room to pick up something and my back went out so, so horribly. Typically it takes me two weeks to recover from that state because I've been there a couple times. And I just found myself fighting discouragement because I had all these things going. At this stage of my life, it's not even about the pain or the discomfort anymore. It's just like, man, I've got these young people. I've got a youth service. I've got a birthday. I've got these things going on. And I was just there fighting. But, you know, I realized that, you know, I can't do much about what state I'm in. But one thing I made up in my mind was I'm not going to get discouraged about being in this place. If it's two days or two weeks. God, whatever it takes for you to heal me, heal me. But it only took one week, and I was back in the house of God. And I'm here to tell you that I had to be content without downtime. You may have to be content with the doctor's report for some time. But in that state, lift up the name of Jesus because he'll pull you out eventually. But he's trying to see what kind of praiser you are, what kind of worshiper you are in the process, along the journey. You may feel lonely only right now but he'll send you a companion if you just learn how to be content he'll give you peace if there's anxiety just learn how to be content he'll come through if you just let him you see being content is not simply about being in a prison or being in a palace. It's about whatever state that I find myself in, there has to be a different way of me thinking. I have to start being more spiritually optimistic. And instead of saying, oh, here we go again. We're going to be fighting like this. Or my body's going to be in this state. Or my family's going to be here. You've got to say, you know what? I'm going to expect something new in Jesus. I'm going to expect something new according to the Holy Ghost. And right now I'm going to be content until my change comes before the battle's even over I'm going to praise him before it's even over I'm going to dance I'm going to shout I'm going to thank him why because I'm learning how to be content even when you're not exactly where you should be be content with the process because I know it's in your heart to, to be righteous. I know it's in your heart to be modest. I know it's in your heart to be holy. I know it's in your heart to be peaceful. I know it's in your heart to be kind and patient. But in the process, say, Father, I'm content. I'm going to do the best I can. I'll repent. I'll acknowledge my sins. But, Lord, allow me to be content with your, what you're putting in my life. Not content with sin but content with the state that you find yourself in. There is a difference. Not content with your failures, but content with the fact that one day by faith, it's not going to be like this. There is a difference. God wants to promote you. God wants to elevate you. But you've got to learn to be content in the prison house before he takes you to the palace. 1 Timothy 6 and 5 tells us, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing, supposing that gain is godliness. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. Someone needs to hear that. If somebody is pushing gain is godliness, it says, from such, withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. <laughs> you know what this is saying is that it's not based on how wealthy you are, how promoted you are, how successful you are. It's saying that there's a state that you can find yourself, whether you're just started or you don't have very much money or you don't have any resources, that you can find contentment in God. And this isn't saying that if you're wealthy that you can't have contentment. It's a matter of how you find yourself in God. Lord, whatever you've gifted me, whatever you've given me, whatever you've allowed me to work for, let me be content with that. That's powerful. Let me be content with that. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain that we can carry nothing out. 
And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wealth and great substance, it can interfere with your faith. Because you can trust in that to solve your problems. You can trust in your doctors above trusting in God first. But if, if we are not content with what we currently have. Again, it's not in what you do or don't have. It's the state that you find yourself before God. That to some, they're going to be gifted and given things that they didn't work for. And God is just that good who he gives. And others, they're good stewards. They know how to plan and map out and seek God. Then God blesses them in that manner. But whatever state that we find ourselves in, the Bible is saying that as long as it's before the Lord, it's right. Be content with that place. Be content with that place. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with what? With such things as ye have. If you really get this, it could really modify your life, change your life. It says, what, what, whatever you have, be content with that. Be content with what? What you've been given and before God, what you've been able to work for. Be content with that. The Amplified Version says it like this, let your character or moral disposition be free from love of money, including greed, avarice, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied. Everybody say satisfied. With your present circumstances and with what you have. To be satisfied. Consistent complaining can be the cancer of our joy. In closing. Consistent complaining can be the cancer of our joy. It could be thought patterns. That kind of are always there that if only this happened, if only he did that, if only she was there, if, if only it was different, then I would be much happier. If I only I made these decisions, if I only worked for this, if I only had these parents, then things would be different. But instead of thinking that way, instead of speaking that way, you, you have to say, Father, as Bishop said, I'm not deserving of anything. It's amazing that I'm still here today. By your grace, by your mercy, by what you prayed up, paid on Calvary for, for my life, Father. It's a miracle that I'm here. Father, help me to be content and help me speak in a manner that I'm thankful for what God has given. The opposite of being content is coveting. This is really what God wants to get out of us today. Is that there's a coveting spirit that God wants to destroy this afternoon. It's stronger now with all the media and all that we see before us. And all the fakeness and all that that is tempting us, seducing us, we start to covet. If only I had more money, if only I had this, or if only I had that, then, then I would be content. The key is being content. The key with being content is appreciating what is yours. Your successes and your failures. What God has placed in your hand, you have to be content with that and say, God, with this, I'm going to give it to you. I'm not going to be covetous. I'm not going to want to be like this person or have what that person has. But God, I want to be the best me that I can be. According to the word of God, through the spirit, I want to be the best that I can be. 
the best that I can be. Cherish that which God has given. Comparing and competition among each other only leads to contention. Today there has to be release in our spirit. Father, maybe you're jealous because your sibling was, you know, mom or dad's favorite. And it bothered you most of your life or, you know, you know somebody else that didn't go through the struggle like you did. I don't know what it is today, but when we compare ourselves to others, we are compromised. You won't be able to worship and praise when you compare. You won't be able to walk in true identity until you're honest before God and say, you know what, Lord? This is who I am, but from this point forward, I hope you're getting what God has put in my spirit. David fought against a giant that was larger in size. His weaponry was greater. He had been in the battlefield for so much longer. Everything about him was superior. But what God used was something that was his. It was inferior in the natural, yet in the name of the Lord. Whew. You don't need greater. You don't need anybody else's. You need yours. You need to find that place before God and say, Lord, Cast down what the devil's put in your mind that you're not worthy enough or you can't be used or you can't be in position or, you know, God doesn't love you because it's not true. He's given you weapons. He's allowed you to walk with things in your life that he is going to bless, multiply, and, and to be used in the miraculous. It's not in a bigger building. It's not in a greater cathedral. It's not in a greater personality or personalities that come from this pulpit that's going to change you. We still have to be locked into that old time church where it's just a place of where we humble ourselves, break ourselves down before God and say, Lord, in my brokenness, Lord, use me. In my weakness, Lord, let me find strength in you. Lord, in the mess that's around me, help me to find the miraculous, Lord. I need you, Jesus. I don't need somebody else's blessing. I don't need somebody else's miracles. But God, I want you to use me, Lord. Use me, Lord, according to your will. When it isn't yours, it is mistreated. And it's mismanaged when it's not yours. It's not yours. When it's not your family, it's different. When it's your house, is different. When you take ownership of what God has given you, you say, Lord, this is mine. You are my God. These are my people. This is my family. Things change. This is my altar. This is my place. If you would stand with me. When it comes to the common, where it is common to you, that's what's going to confuse the enemy. Today the Lord wants to bless somebody at this altar. Confuse the enemy instead of complaining or groveling about things that you're not happily, happy about. Say, Father, help me to be content. Help me to be content with my family, with my spouse, with my ministry, with my surroundings, but what you've given me, Lord, with the gifts, the position, the place, and the body that you placed me. Help me to be content with that. And it is in that place that you're going to slay demons, giants. You're going to put the enemy to flight out of your house, out of your mind, as you just give God what is rightfully his. Why don't we come to this altar?